Without any further ado, uh, today Tom Wilson um, is our speaker, and Tom is our resident historian, as well as <laughs> wears many other hats. And um, I don't want to, you know, he got his undergraduate degree at William and Mary, and then he came north here, and he's been here ever since. And he has given everything from a TED talk. Uh, to um, lots of different conference proceedings. And he, this is the title of his talk, but you can see he, he's good at giving directions. And this was uh, a project that we had um, where we, we put monitoring equipment on the PT Barnum and the ferry transected the, the sound and this ran for a number of years. And Tom is in charge of all the instrumentation for that. Um, he's also, uh, provided technical support for a large number of research projects, and um, Kamazima and I uh, went with Tom to Africa, and here we are at the equator, and, um, and, and Tom was monitoring, had all the information right there. Um, okay. Um, so he's been on, he's participated on a lot of research cruises, um, over the years, this is the Barnum that was uh, he was up here with the instrumentation, and I don't think he was on quite all these cruises, but um, he's worked in various waters, including uh, in the center there. I'm not sure that's the ferry, but in, in uh, Lake Victoria. Um, okay, he's done an awful lot of mentoring, and uh, these are his students, and and um, he's all his students have been well. I shouldn't say far more successful than mine, but uh, anyway, he's done a wonderful job of mentoring. And Trevor, for example, is now in charge of all the UNOLS vehicles, uh, vessels out of the University of Hawaii. Um, and Lucas is going to be uh, heading up the eShop, um, I don't know, as of the 15th of May or as something of, like that? The 23rd of May. Okay. He becomes my boss. All right. So anyway, and here is Tom front and center. And, and this is in Africa. We're signing ledgers and posing, take, posing for photos is taken extremely seriously. And so we have many of these kind of uh, pictures. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, here, here he is, uh, and these are, well, this is only one of the, the uh, kind of wildlife you meet there, and they weigh about 1,500 pounds each, so uh, you, you know, have to keep your eyes out. And Tom could outrun them. And yeah, well, actually, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't quite Photoshop this, but this one comes with a park ranger that is trying to outrun that hippo that decided to chase after them. Okay, and then, of course, as part of all of this, um, we had to sample beers from uh, um, all over, and I'll take a tusker any day, but there are a lot of others that are, are quite willing. So, today, Tom's gonna talk about all the things he's learned, and for years, I've been admiring that that cartoon outside his, his uh, office but as you can see um you know there's always that kind of thing and i'm sure there's a box somewhere with all the spare parts in tom's office uh, okay and with that tom wilson it's all yours well thank you josie uh good morning everybody and thanks for coming to my talk uh the world being what it is today i wish to provide the following disclaimers uh, unless otherwise noted, uh, mention of a company in this presentation does not constitute an official endorsement by the state of New York, the State University of New York, or the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. The presenter has no ownership interest in any commercial entity mentioned, but being where we are and who we are, I've added the special ocean rated no chop busting disclaimers that the presider, the presenter has never dated anyone connected to any mentioned company, <laughs> nor is this ever likely. Uh, neither have those folks plied in with baubles, nor trickets, nor fancy food and drink, although some of them probably ought to. And anyone who implies otherwise is asking for trouble. All right, so 
To kick things off, let us consider the question, how did this deer in the headlights graduate student manage to become useful enough to be an asset at this amazing organization for more than 40 years? The answer is a little luck, a certain perseverance, and a lot of assistance. If I try to acknowledge everyone who had helped me along the way, we would still be here when the sun came up tomorrow. So I ask forgiveness in advance for any omissions. Sorry. Having said that, no fair retrospective of my career would be complete without a slight digression into events prior to my arrival at MSRC, the Marine Sciences Research Center, in August of 1978, specifically the incredibly fortunate circumstances of my childhood. Uh, my father, Dr. Thomas Cabell Wilson, MD, was a healer, a teacher, a mentor, a builder, an inventor, a master gardener, a friend to helpless creatures, both tame and wild, a mechanic, a sea scout, a storyteller, and a world-class prankster. Uh, Dad served in the U.S. Naval Medical Corps while uh, before practicing medicine for more than 50 years, primarily in Southern West Virginia. Dad started as a coal camp doctor, then became a board certified anatomic and clinical pathologist, trained by a twist of history, trained by the finest German Jewish pathologists who had escaped the Nazi regime with all proof of their qualifications destroyed, only to settle in the state of West Virginia because at the time, in the 1950s, West Virginia did not require a pathologist to have a medical degree because they did not work on living human beings. When he saw the need, my father founded the first emergency room in my hometown, as well as running a family practice. Even after he officially retired, dad continued to treat friends and family, buying a case of flu vaccine every year uh, to offer free of charge to all takers, including the attendees at my cousin Nancy's bridal shower. <laughs> the last year before he let his medical license expire, he spent his birthday making house calls, writing prescription refills, and recommending other doctors to his patients. Dad taught me planning and persistence. He used to say, plan your work, then work your plan. He also said, if you don't know what to do, just keep putting one foot in front of the other. My mother, Mary Lou Motley Wilson, was raised in a small town in rural Virginia where she missed a year of school and nearly died after contracting tuberculosis. Not only did she graduate with her high school class, she graduated the valedictorian of her high school class. She learned to drive trucks on a relative's farm at the age of 12 and played Rhapsody in Blue for her senior piano recital and not some watered down version because we still have the sheet music she used. When she enrolled in the pharmacy school of Virginia Commonwealth University, she was one of just three women in an entering class of 100. Undeterred, she founded the, the pharmacy sorority at VCU, which persists to this day, graduated and became one of the first female registered pharmacists in the state of Virginia. Mom was elite, but never elitist. She treated everyone she encountered with equal courtesy and respect. The lady who came to help her clean the house would be invited to coffee and cookies afterwards, served on the good china. She was never afraid to speak truth to power and to use John Lewis's term of art, make good trouble, traits you may have noticed in me from time to time. <laughs> Mom taught us about privilege before the term was coined. She said, every talent and advantage you have creates an equal ob uh, obligation to serve others, particularly those less fortunate. Also about choices. There are two choices in a person's life, too important for anyone else to make for them, what you do for a living and who you marry. Mom and dad celebrated accomplishment, but their love for my brothers and I was never conditional on success. They trusted us. As we turned 18, uh, as we turned 18, our names were added to the family checking account, the better to transfer funds in the days before Venmo and PayPal. They constituted the loving launch pad that supported our dreams and enabled uh, my brother and my accomplishments. I am the person I am today because they were the people they were all of their days. And not just me. My brother Hale took his BS in physics from William & Mary and his PhD in material science from Cornell to IBM, where he worked on accelerated age testing of semiconductor electronics. He survived multiple rounds of layoffs, 
each time passing a document containing networking resources to his laid off colleagues to help them find a new job within the company. His supervisor reportedly once said that he would resign rather than lay Hale off because he had no interest in taking on that workload. When IBM finally sold Hale's division to a company named Global Foundry, Hale went along with only the ID card and the sign on the building changes changed where he works to this day. My little brother, John, is the real overachiever in the family with a BS from MIT and a PhD from Stanford, both in aeronautical and astronautical engineering, plus an MD from Harvard. He applied to the astronaut corps, ranked first of 56 candidates in his group, but was disqualified by the medical board because his uncorrected eyesight didn't meet their standard of physical perfection. Uh, he took his disappointment to Silicon Valley, then to Garmin, where the attitude sensor he developed is at the heart of every glass cockpit Garmin supplies to light aircraft around the world. He became Garmin's first remote employee, relocating to the New Hampshire, where he built a house with an amazing shaker table that can extend from the dining room into the living room and seat the entire extended family for Thanksgiving dinner. Not bad for three young men raised in the coal fields of Southern West Virginia with no advanced placement, no private schools, just a loving home full of books upstairs, a workshop downstairs, and a garden out back. Now, while today's 10 themes are not necessarily presented in any order of importance, it's no surprise that the first two derive from the wise teachings of my childhood. Number theme one, do what you love and learn to live on the money it makes you. This was one of dad's sayings and completely endorsed by mom and given the greed is good attitude common to our society, it should perhaps be unsurprising how many people just don't realize the prison that materialism can become. The secret to unlocking a better mindset is realizing that money is a tool, not a scorecard. You spend too much of your life at your job to do something you hate just because it makes uh, a lot of money. Money does not buy happiness, although I have observed that true poverty does come with a free side order of misery. When you learn to appreciate having enough, when you define having enough and learn to appreciate having enough, that is sustainability on a personal level. Now, there are practical limits to this principle. When I was a senior in high school, I loved both music and science and engineering. I decided that more people make a good living at science and engineering, and I could always play my saxophone on the uh, side. This was a good decision since I meet people every day who are 10 times better musicians than I am. We of me playing with the Stony Brook University Big Band and with uh, Ray Anderson, the Jedi Jazz Master. I recommend Ray is now a professor emeritus, but he still plays around. And anytime you get an opportunity to see him, you should. Okay, next. There is no right reason to do the wrong thing. As this quote from Mark Twain demonstrates, this is not a new concept. My dad always played it right down the middle, teaching us that any advantage gained through lying, cheating, or stealing was temporary, but the damage to your integrity and your self-respect was permanent, even if nobody else ever found out, because you would know. While I've lost sleep over whether I made the best choice in difficult situations, I've never lost sleep worrying what might happen if people found out what I'd done. But what about people that do the wrong thing? My first observation, you can be a great scientist and still be a worm as a human being. <laughs> now, I'd like to apologize to any decent, hardworking worms across the biosphere who are offended by this comparison. Sorry. Uh, while the vast majority of folks at this and other universities are decent and dedicated people, the environment of academia sometimes allows behavior that in the business world would get you immediately walked to the curb carrying your belongings in a cardboard box. <laughs> While sexual misconduct has thankfully moved beyond the pale in recent years, bullying, backstabbing, and just plain meanness is often tolerated by the institution, particularly when coming from highly successful individuals. What Jackie Collier euphemistically referred to as the a-hole problem at our last SOMAS retreat is unlikely to ever be completely solved, but I challenge each of you to continue to push back on unacceptable behavior. To be fair, Mark Lang's uh, catchphrase, recognize, uh, you must recognize that it's highly unlikely you will ever be friends with everyone you work with. Perhaps your styles are different. 
maybe your goals are in conflict. The other person may be going through tough times in their life, or they might just be jerks. <laughs> if none of these things are true, you may need even need to consider whether you are the jerk in the relationship. Most of the time, you're going to have to work through those difficult relationships, regardless of the reasons. And though you sometimes learn more from bad bosses and crummy coworkers than you do from good ones, it can still be a tough road. So how to cope day to day? Well, yes. Okay. First off, um, understand that these kinds of conflicts are chess games, not gladiatorial combat. Uh, losing your cool is the wrong thing. Move 99.9% .9 of the time. It's always better to disengage, sit and think, talk to a colleague, go home, hear, have a refreshing beverage or soothing herbal cigarette, pet the dog, cuddle the cat, and sleep on your response. This is uh, this is the Wilson uh, Lombardi Avenue uh, morale officer, uh, uh, always ready for duty, two seats, no waiting. <laughs> um, so uh, hold back on that verbal outburst or the flaming email. If it's true now, it will still be true in the morning. And um, if given an impossible directive, turn it back by asking for clarifications. List the issues in writing and confirm you are directed, confirm if you are being directed to proceed despite the negative consequences. So time to call up my first example of virtue at Stony Brook. Jerry Schubel, Dean and Director of the Marine Sciences Research Center from 1974 to 1994. Jerry deserves enormous credit for launching MSRC onto the trajectory that led us to where we are today. He gave me the job I still hold, writing a position description in 1983 that was updated in 2019, not because it was in any way obsolete, but because human resources wanted to fit it into the Procrustean bid of their, bid of their current format. <laughs> So for 36 years, they said, we have to update your performance. I don't see why. If you ever get the chance, go see the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, which is Jerry's dream writ large. Oh, good. That slide didn't disappear. There is also an oral history uh, recording at Johns Hopkins University, which I just found yesterday and intend to listen to very soon. Uh, during his time as provost, Jerry had a conflicted relationship um, with uh, then SBU president John Marburger. In later years, Jerry, Jerry's public joke, I'm not, I'm not telling tales out of school here, the public joke was that he had stepped down as provost because of fatigue and ill health. He and the president were sick and tired of each other. So when, when I once went to Jerry for advice about a work conflict, he had the following advice, which worked for, which had worked for him. So Jerry's rules for difficult work relationships. First of all, document every single interaction in writing, especially verbal agreements. Document every change to those verbal agreements. It may seem silly to meet somebody in the hallway and say, we're going to get together tomorrow. We're going to clean that room out at eight at, at 930 in the morning. You send an email confirming our conversation. We're cleaning the room out at 9.30 in the morning. That way, if they show up at 8 o'clock in the morning, they can't claim, oh, oh, he wasn't supposed to. We told him to be there at 8. He wasn't there at 8. So um, your memory is fallible. Their memory is fallible. Or they miss, might just be looking for an opportunity to use the ambiguity of a verbal agreement to stick it to you. So ask for confirmation. Please confirm or correct my understanding. Uh, Jerry Schubel used to use the phrase, unless I hear otherwise, by such and such a time, I will presume or I will proceed or whatever he was going to do. Uh, you got to have some horsepower to use that, but keep it in your kit. Copy others if needed, but with care. A more diplomatic approach is to widen your CC list on a second follow-up if you have, feel like you're being ignored. Now, item four. There is no substitute for deep knowledge and rigor. There's no better example of this than Don Pritchard. He was one of the members on this of uh, he was one of the members of the sea conditions prediction team for D-Day in World War II. No pressure there. Um, Don founded the Chesapeake Bay Institute of Johns Hopkins University, serving as director there from 1949 
1973. He was a PhD advisor to, among others, Jerry Schubel, Akira Akubo, and Bob Wilson. Came to Stony Brook in 1978. I'm not, I'll get there in a minute. He came to Stony Brook in 1978 and remained until his retirement, one of them anyway, he retired about four times, uh, in 1988. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 1993. Don taught me about uh, accuracy, precision, calibrations, and measuring salinity. When, the, when UNESCO declined to define salinity in their new scale below five parts per thousand by PSU, sorry, sorry, Don, uh, PSU, Don actually wrote a set of equations that went from five to zero, and we still use those today. Don loved technology, even though it did not always love him. Uh, when he was at CBI, he was a director, but he really loved going down to the electronics shop after hours, where Ed Schemer was, had kind of my job there. Uh, well, Ed would be working, and he would, Ed would have something out on the, out on the bench, but then Don would start messing with it, and very often he would do something to it. It would no longer be functional. <laughs> so... So Ed learned that at the end of his workday, he would take the instrument that he was working on that was time critical, that had to go out in the field. He would put it away and he'd take something else out equally <laughs> interesting and leave it on the bench so that if Don came down, he would meddle with that. And if he messed something up, it wasn't a big deal. This was known as a Pritchard box. <laughs> it was actually called the Pritchard box one of his retirements, I built at Jerry Schubel's behest a Pritchard box, which was a frame with an old Wang calculator uh, keyboard in it connected to a sound generator, like this cheap ray gun. So every button you pushed had a different noise. And Don was provided and it said, you know, call for Dr. Goodwrench, you know, that kind of, it was, a, it, was a, it was a presentation to him. And then as the tributes rolled on, Don couldn't keep his hands off of it. He kept pulling it out and he would just sort of be touching it. And it would <laughs> Dr. Pritchard has been a <laughs> and finally his wife had to take it away from him. So um, so when I acquired our Martech Mark VI son, it he sat for days. This is the where the rigor comes in. He sat for days by our calibration tank, testing its accuracy and stability. And this is what I wanted to show you. I still have the logbooks, and this is three of 10 pages of closely written notes on the performance of this device. He spent days calibrating it, testing it, and when it was done, he finally concluded it's pretty good and went ahead and used it in his field work. Forever after, until we retired the MarTech, anyone who asked a question about you know, well, does a MarTech work well? I said, Don Pritchard says it's pretty good. And that was all that was necessary. So Don bought the first privately owned microcomputer at MSRC. It was an Osborne one. He ordered the first time he saw the demo mo model at Computerland in, Com in Comac. There was, um, there was a, a place called Computerland and it had a store in Comac. And he saw it and the Osborne one was 1995 CPM, microcomputer, 52 column by 24 line screen, about teeny little screen, 292K disk drives, but it came with software and it really worked. And he ordered, he he whipped his checkbook out, wrote a $2,000 check right there. We still have that, Mark Lang, it should go into the museum. Uh, the serial number on it is less than 1,000. <laughs> so, I hope that it will be added to the MSRC archives sometime. But knowing when to ask questions, moving along, knowing when to ask questions, find other experts and collaborate runs a close second to that intellectual expertise. So here's Harry Carter. Uh, he was a graduate of the US Coast Guard Academy, class of 1944, but he was commissioned in 1943 as a result of World War II. He served in the Pacific aboard the USS General George M. Randall and in the Atlantic aboard the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Argo. 
He served in the Coast Guard for 23 years, attaining the rank of commander. In 1957, he became the commanding officer of the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Bramble, which with two other vessels charted the Northwest Passage through the Arctic. Upon retirement, retirement, right, he came to work. Uh, he went on to hold faculty appointments at Johns Hopkins University's Chesapeake Bay Institute, the sort of the parent of this institution, and then again here at the Marine Sciences Research Center. Harry and Don worked together for decades. Though he was the consummate field scientist, Harry used to say, I mean, they were perfect complementary skills, and Don was a world-class theoretician. Harry was a, was a world-class consummate field guy. And... But it's funny, Harry would say, you know, he would do the very best job he could. We'd have everything tightened up as much. And then he would say, well, you know, you only know things to about 5%. You never know things to more than about 5% in the real world anyway. Now, that was not an excuse for sloppy work. It was an exhortation that I hope you will take with you that you need to develop hypotheses so strong that you can prove or disprove them, even if the data is not as perfect as you would like it to be. So, Harry also holds the uh, Harry also holds the title of greatest per purchase requisition of all time. Um, we needed a bunch of salinity bottles for I think it was the Le Le the lead study, Lagrange annularian diffusion study in the Great South Bay. We needed many, many salinity bottles, but salinity bottles from the scientific supply company were like five fifty dollars a piece. But then Harry noticed that, I should have brought one with me, that Rolsch beer bottles, you know, there's that brown bottle and they've got a little flippy ceramic top with a, with a rubber stopper and a, and, a, and a chip, that they were $2 at the local beer distributor. So... Harry wrote a justification for the requisition to Stony Brook Beverage, explaining the savings to be had by buying Rolsch bottles rather than salinity bottles and assuring everyone that the beer would in fact be poured out before use. <laughs> and if you come to the e-shop, we still have several dozen Rolsch bottles <laughs> with salinity samples. So. Next on, five, mentoring may be the most consequential thing any of us ever do. We stand on the shoulders of giants. I stand on Don and Harry's uh, shoulders and many others. Uh, give, I, I exhort you to give as many folks as much opportunity as you can, as often as you can, in whatever ways you can. And one day they may stand on your shoulders. In a perfect world, everyone mentors all the time but I just have to call out a few folks. I wanted to call out a few folks who've passed through the eShop as student assistants and gone on to greater things. Hamish Bowman, <laughs> a, a computing and numerical simulation technician at the University of Otago in New Zealand, uh, living his best life, going out on, on, the, on the Antarctic ice cap and uh, doing seismic studies of glaciers, reminding me living the life of Steve Buscemi's character in the movie Armageddon. The pay is good, the scenery changes, and they let me play with explosives. Trevor Young, uh, instrument technician at University of Hawaii Ocean Technology Group. Um, he's basically the senior electronics guy there. Um, I got the chance to tour the instrument installation he has designed and installed on the research vessel Kilo Moana. Uh, to quote Star Wars, he was once the student, but now he is the master. <laughs> Alex Stedden, um, working for Boeing Undersea Systems or Boeing Underwater Systems, it's so secret that I don't even know the exact name, but working for Boeing, uh, th doing things he can't talk about to keep our country secure. And of course, Miles Litzman, um, Larry would be proud, uh, is just enlisted in the NOAA Corps. Every one of these folks and quite a few others have contributed tremendously to the eShop's success, and um, they may well accomplish more in their careers than I have in mine. It's an honor to have helped them along, even in a small way. All right. 
Topic six, there is a world of difference between management and leadership. Treating people well earns dividends. When you talk to somebody, when you manage people, praise in public and express concerns privately. Thank people. It's free. It takes no time, it takes no effort. Just thank people for what they do all the time. And when you are the leader, and one day, well, some of you are already, and some of you will be, I hope many of you will be, be the leader you wish you had had. And uh, the leader that, um, the leader that uh, uh, some of us were lucky enough to have is, of course, Larry Swanson. Um, whenever I have had the opportunity to weigh uh, in on the search for any administrative position at Stony Brook, the first requirement I offer is that the person should be a really decent human being. Almost invariably, this statement goes over like a lead balloon. Usually the response is a minimally polite variant of, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, before discussion resumes. But it's absolutely important. And Larry was the proof. Larry was not just a decent human being, but an exemplary one. He was a gentleman and a gentleman who appreciated every contribution and every contributor. When he was interim dean, he turned the school's faculty meetings into faculty staff meetings, a practice that continues to this day. He was a great leader in part because he knew he we knew he would never compromise his high ethical standards, regardless of the enticement. We could throw ourselves into the work and wholeheartedly, knowing Larry had our back, that he would appreciate and applaud us for what we accomplished and understand and protect us if we tried our best but came up short. Larry understood that if you never fail, that means you're playing it safe. And he knew the value of encouraging his team to swing for the fences. Larry was uh, intelligent, talented, and wise. He had an awesome grasp of so many subjects and the perspective of decades of experience in many different roles. He was generous and welcoming, always eager to share what he knew, whether it was a huddle in his office at lunchtime or teaching a class. Even after decades of working together, I still learned new things from him every time we met. Larry was a great supervisor. He knew when to let me alone to do my job, which was most of the time. And I knew when I needed to get his advice or direction. We seldom disagreed, but if he made a decision different from my recommendation, his direction was firm, but never disrespectful. Looking back, I cannot remember one of those circumstances where in the long term, he was wrong and I was right. Larry was funny, but never cutting or mean. He had spent part of his childhood in Appalachia, where his father was assigned that when his father was assigned there as a civil engineer. Knowing I grew up in West Virginia, we swapped mountain lore, including his occasional joking request for my favorite squirrel recipes. <laughs> when Helen thanked him for letting me add a week of vacation to a conference trip, he replied, well, it's a small price to pay for a whole week without any of Tom lo Tom's long emails. <laughs> So a scientist, a leader, a teacher, a mentor, supervisor, colleague, a shipmate, and a friend. Larry was outstanding at all these things and more. There is a recording of the tribute Somas did for Larry, uh, had my remarks and many others. And uh, if you look it up on the Somas website, site, it is time well spent. So leaders do let people fail occasionally. If there's an upside to if there's no upside to, to risks, people won't take them. And if people don't fail occasionally, they're probably not trying hard enough. I sort of said that before. So you should forgive others if they fail, and you should forgive yourself if you fail. Now the Roosevelt quote here is too small to read. It's from a large, longer speech called Citizenship in a Republic that he had given at the Sorbonne in Paris on April 23rd, 1910. And it reads. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually does strive to do the deeds who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, 
at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place will never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So I saw this in real life in Barbados in 1996. Bob Cowan, uh, a faculty member here for many years, now the director of the Hatfield Marine Center in Oregon. But in 1996, he and I were on a ship off of Barbados doing current meter mooring deployment. Now, if you've ever seen that happen, what happens is that you string the instruments out. They're on a long, long wire with floats and a release at the bottom and floats. And, and the idea is that you hold on. I am going to use that. that uh, I'm going to use my favorite green laser pointer. <laughs> I, just, I bought this many, many years ago. It used to have a Starship Enterprise firing phasers on it because it's a really strong one. So over here, you'll see that the whole instrument, the whole instrument array has been strung out and it's, you know, a thousand or two thousand feet long. And this is right here is the um, a railroad wheel with an acoustic release above it. Now, for this setup, we had an acoustic release at the bottom and we actually had a float release at the top. So the idea being there were two ways to get the strip, get the mooring back. If we could get the acoustic release to let go at the bottom, but if we couldn't, then the float release would pop at the top. So we're we're sort of cruising along at low speed with all of this strung out behind us like a, like a kite and waiting for the moment that one of the bosuns was going to pull the, pull the rope and let the railroad wheel go, at which point it would drop essentially straight to the bottom. We were waiting to come to exactly the right depth to be able to do that because our top float had to be, you know, we want our things at different heights and our top float had to be uh, within a certain distance so that the surface float would release. And somehow there was a miscommunication and the bosun pulled the rope early, instantly dropping our uh, dropping our uh, 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 mooring into about 100 feet too much water, 50, 100 feet too much water, and instantly having the chance, having, cutting in half the chance that we would get it back. Because if the bottom float, if the bottom release didn't go, then the top release wouldn't reach the surface. And Bob Cowan, who was the PI on the thing, I have never forgotten this moment that he grabbed every member of the science party before we left the back deck. And he said to us, he huddled us up and he said, listen, man who pulled the rope, and I don't remember his name, the guy that pulled the rope made a mistake. He is a complete professional. He made a mistake. Any of us could have made that mistake. Anyone, I don't want to add, I don't want a single person to say a single thing. He feels bad enough. He's beating himself badly up, up enough now. And anyone who says anything about this will answer to me. And that was, to me, one of the great examples of leadership and forgiveness that I've ever seen in my years here. And in fact, we ended up able to go down. We, well, let's just say some people went way beyond scuba, uh, uh, safe scuba depth and, and got there and got a, uh, a uh, hook onto the mooring. We were able to pull it up and drop it into the right into the right depth. OK. Um, all right. Next topic seven. Document, document, document. This is for you. I mean, this is not this is not email, email, email. And a short message be, beats a long memory. Presume you have a memory like a goldfish. I certainly do. Write checklists for everything. You, if anybody who's seen me set up the CTD on the Seawolf or, or anything else knows that there are checklists for everything. And that's because when you're at sea, particularly when you're at sea and the boat starts to move, I find that about 20 to 40% of your IQ rolls out, it liquefies and goes out of your ears. <laughs> so you don't want to have to think I mean, you're doing your best to think, but you don't want to rely on thinking. So write the checklist, use the checklist, and take pictures of everything. Um, I actually take, now what we do now is when we've set up the CTD and we've set up the uh, 
uh, the hydro system on board the sea. Well, if we take pictures of the check sheet, the check sheets go in the logbook in on the boat. We take pictures of the check sheets. We email them to the PIs, and that way we've got copies. Um, many years ago, I can ran out of time, so I didn't, I couldn't find a, a picture of him anyway. There's a guy named Michael Reynolds worked at Brookhaven National Labs. He was the director of the atmospheric radiation, the ARM project at BNL. He was a he, he is, he, he is, he's retired to the Pacific Northwest. He is a consummate engineer, consummate scientist. And one of the things that struck me many, many years ago is he would go to his office and he had bookcases full of three ring binders. And the three ring binders were full pictures because he took pictures of everything, film pictures. He took pictures of every piece of equipment. He took pictures of every uh, research group. He took pictures of, of everything that he could think to take pictures of because he said to me, I said, wow, the pictures. He said, you will never have this group of people together again. You may never see this piece of equipment again, at least not in one piece. And it was true that when we were talking about something to do, she said, oh, yeah, this is very much like what we did in Bora Bora in 1987. And he would pull it off the shelf, open it up, show us the picture worth a thousand words. And then one thing that I started to try to do, but I keep forgetting, is take pictures before and after. If you're going in and cleaning up a mess, you know, you're like rewiring something or reorganizing something. I always take a picture afterwards and then I say, Rex. You know, this is nice, but it would be so much better if I could say, look, this is before and after. So that's my new that's my new uh, my new resolution. I'm working on it now. Pass it along to you. So topic eight, there is. No more important skill than speaking and writing clearly, logically and persuasively. And I have to say that. Um, this is my master's thesis advisor, Bud Brinkhouse, Budoegian. His, uh, he was Dutch. English was not his first language, but he taught me to write. And one way he taught me to write is he refused, thank God there were word processors by this point, because he refused to accept any piece of writing from me that was not perfect. Perfect spelling, perfect uh, perfect spelling, perfect grammar, perfect construction, and yes, in these olden days, two spaces after each period. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but there are, and, and, and he helped a lot, but there are many kinds of communication beyond scientific publications. You need to work on them all. Memoranda, another old MSRC old hand is a guy named Fred Roberts. Fred Roberts was a... Uh, uh, associate, uh, kind of a Bill Wise kind of a guy long before Bill Wise. And Fred had the most exquisitely beautiful style of writing memos. It was like you would read a memo from Fred. Oh, this is lovely. You know, make it fun. Make it fun. He made it fun. So uh, when I'm writing an important document, I print it out, physically print it out at least once. I read it and I share it. I find that errors that slip by on the screen often will reveal themselves in hard copy. Uh, I practice an oral presentation beforehand. Awkwardness that may not show up on the screen on your script <laughs> script may become obvious when you actually try to get it out of your mouth. Um, I time my presentations and add time markers in your notes or on the slides. Like my, my notes have got little bracketed, you know, should be this many minutes and so far I'm doing okay. Um, so other types of communication continued elevator pitches. You want to have an elevator pitch is a, uh, for those who haven't heard it is a term from business that says, if you get asked a question, suppose you're in the elevator with the CEO of the company and you want to ask them something. What can you, how can you present yourself or present your idea or present your proposal in the amount of time it takes for an elevator to go from one floor to the other, which is about 30 seconds. You need to have them ready to take advantage of those opportunities. And sometimes it's a chance encounter. Sometimes it's a chat at a cocktail party. 
uh, and and sometimes avoid disaster. I have a, a a relative of mine who once worked at Apple Computer and actually told us many stories. I'll again remove the names that Steve Jobs once got on an elevator with an employee and looked at him and said, "So, hi, how are you doing? How are you doing? What do you do?" And the guy, I don't know whether he just wasn't ready for this. He didn't have his elevator pitch and he sort of blobbled and I remember the job said, have a nice day, got off the elevator and look, went to his office and said, so-and-so fire it because he doesn't know what he's doing. He can't explain what he does for the company. Now, of course, jobs is, was the high functioning jerk, but let's face it, you know, sometimes the jerk runs the company. Um, it was not one of his better choices. But um, after a lecture, uh, oh, yes. So if you're at a lecture, this is one of my favorites. If you've gone to a lecture or you're at a seminar or you're in a public hearing, you're going to get a chance to ask one question or perhaps give one comment. You want to make it a good one. You write it out beforehand, you think about it, you print it large enough so you won't have to visibly hold it up, and you improvise it when you deliver. The other thing is, don't, act, don't ask the first question, because the question that you've perfectly put together might be asked by somebody else. And so have a backup question, or a couple of backup questions, or be ready to ask a follow-up if the person answering the question kind of brushes it off. So prepare to persevere and keep your cool, especially in public hearings. This is actually, and again, I should probably have a picture of Lee Koppelman. I took public policy from Lee Koppelman and it was just wonderful. Although he was, uh, he would show up because he didn't have a textbook. He would show up with a luggage cart with at least one and sometimes two boxes of paper where he had copied article after article, he would give you 100 to 150 pages of reading Xeroxed every week. And whoa, be, I, I, I only once did I ask a question. I did once ask a question. And he looked at me and said, Mr. Wilson, if you had done the reading last week, that question was answered. <laughs> Oh, okay. Sorry, Lee. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Goppelman. But one of the great things he did at the end of that, um, at the end of that public, uh, uh, of that uh, public policy class, is he put together a mock public hearing on fisheries, and he took all of, he called in all of his buddies who normally sat in the front and and got all of this noise and abuse from the uh, from the from the audience to play the audience. So we're giving a public we're giving a fisheries presentation. And then these people, I remember one guy stood up, might have been Frank Rothell actually, and said, yeah, my name is Joe Finn. And I don't like the way that you're doing this fisheries thing. You know, like, what do you guys know? And and the thing is that we had to sit there and like deal with this and uh, and, and come up with a reasonable response. So work on that too. Fan, interestingly enough, at the Berkeley College of Music, there's apparently a performance uh, class where part of the tradition is that while people are trying to perform, there's some disruption. Like they get, they get other faculty members to come running through and screaming across the stage and things like that. And you're not supposed to slow down. You're not supposed to stop. Learn to continue your performance regardless of what's going on. And then finally, um, I think it's an it's a it's a good thing. I remember going to Harry once, Harry Carter once, and asking him, um, you know, I need to write, I've been asked to write a recommendation or you know, and and I'm I'm not sure, you know, what to say. And he said, presume anything you write, even in confidence, may eventually be seen by the whole world. And of course, if you tell them the truth, going back to point two or something like that, you could probably live with that. 
So topic nine, and I'm right on time, good. So topic nine, the C will find you out. This is a, uh, uh, a little bit of a quote from a novel called The Voyage by Philip Caputo. And um, uh, it says, you, you cut corners, leave something done halfway to right. You say to yourselves, ah, that's good enough. And the sea will find you out, boys, and she'll show no mercy nor forgiveness either. So ship shape is more than an aspiration in our business. And I think the same, much the same can be said about atmospheric research, field research of any type. Ship shape is more than an aspiration. It's an operational necessity. Now, I have more experience in the, uh, in, the, in the oceanic world, but keep spares because I used to say it was a long swim to Radio Shack, but now it's a really long swim to Radio Shack because they don't exist anymore. <laughs> so I'll say UPS doesn't deliver your Amazon package to see. And in fact... Very often you 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 find, you know, you get used to overnight, you know, like for 25 order, you get it the next day at 7 a.m. That's Long Island, baby. If you're in Kansas chasing storms, you might be next Thursday to get something delivered. So the best spare is an entire hot spare unit, if you can, if you can afford it. Just take an extra one along. Um, back up your data, back up your data, back up your data, back up your data. And this is my one commercial uh, recommendation. It's a company called Drive Savers. They are uh, the best in the business. They are fully secure. They, they're, they're the people that, that uh, Hollywood producers send their laptops to when they've had to run over by a limo and there's a screenplay on it. Or generals have a tank run over their laptop and the battle plan is crunched. Um, they are the, one of the nice things about them is that they will um, is that they actually will take your drive and they will see what data they can get and bef and they'll they'll then say to you okay we can get the following here's the list of files we could recover and it will cost you and it'll cost you usually around two to three thousand dollars but you can get them back so you can make as opposed to paying money up front and maybe they get the data back. No data, no money. Also, I kind of like the fact that they have uh, licensed mental health professionals on staff <laughs> because people have been known to call them in a, in a crisis, in, in, in physically in a crisis situation, and they'll say, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, let me just uh, look on that shipping, and uh, why don't you talk to Trudy while we're, while we're arranging the return? So fortunately, um, only once have I ever seen draft savers have to be used. It was actually a student who shall remain nameless and it's long gone. A student who shall remain nameless who had a year of PhD data on a single hard drive and the hard drive died. And that when they sent to Drive Savers because $3,000 was a, was a, was cheap to get a year of your life back, but a cheaper way to get your life back, a year of your life back, uh, is to back up myself at my house I have every piece of data is in five different places. It's on a RAID drive. So there are two separate drives with the data. I have a cloud backup is the third place that it's backed up continuously to the cloud. I have a portable hard drive, which I plug in that's automatically mirrored from the uh, RAID drive and then Every few weeks, I put it in a Pelican case, a little cheap Pelican case, and I take it to my friend's house and I bring the other one, that's the fifth copy, comes back. And so I have everything in five different places. And I will say, those of you who were at my 60th birthday party, Kamazima was there, may have noticed I was a little funny because that day as I got, as my wife a complete surprise 60th birthday party. The same day, for some reason, my entire hard drive array went down, wiped 1.8 million files. So I was at the party and I would go, this is a wonderful party. Excuse me a minute. I was downstairs trying to make things work, but my cloud backup saved me. I got every file back. So it can happen to you. So, uh, <laughs> a couple of perhaps humorous things. This will make Kamazima laugh. 
No matter what the server might say, ice in a developing country is not made from bottled water. That is a that is just don't don't ever take anyone's word for that. Uh, also, it's probably not a good idea to ask for someone to cook you something quickly at pizza. If anybody's interested, I can tell that story. And the, the third the third part of that is never place your medications in airline checked baggage. You never know when you might need them. So on to the 10th and final, my 10th and final point. What we do is important and it's made a difference. In the 1960s, we had Silent Spring, the DDT crisis. We had the Cuyahoga River catch fire in Cleveland, Ohio, catch fire a dozen times. In 19, the 1970s, we had the first Earth Day. And I remember I was actually the chair of my Earth Day committee in my, in my middle school. And environmentalists were called tree huggers and other things that we can't talk about on a family show. And we had Love Canal, toxic waste. In the 1980s, we had the famous Islip garbage barge. We had dumping of sewage sludge into the New York Bight Apex. All those things are gone. In 1978, this is one of my favorite stories. In 1978, I was a brand new graduate student, that deer in the headlights kid. And I was on my first cruise on the research vessel Onrust to lower New York Harbor. And we were doing a survey, physical survey and a fishery survey, fisheries trawls. In 1978, uh, Lower New York Harbor was a pretty grotty place. Um, they was sort of a lot of sewage and uh, combined sewer, over, sewer overflows and uh, uh, used birth control devices, which were euphemistically called Coney Island whitefish, were floating by in the in the in the current. I'm not kidding. You. And um, but we did a fisheries trawl and we caught a sturgeon. An Atlantic surgeon about this size. This is not a picture from that day. Uh, a, a just just a little 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 one, and it was remarkable. Uh, Chris Stubbe, the captain of the boat, came charging out of the bridge, hearing we had a sturgeon, ran over, picked it up like a baby, and says, "Take your measurements. Take your measurements." We measured it, and he put it back in the water like it was a child. Because finding an Atlantic sturgeon in New York Harbor at that time was almost unheard of. We now do, as many of you know, we do a sturgeon survey where we're out there catching sturgeon and we are putting trackers on them and we are tracking sturgeon. Within the last few years, we caught an eight foot sturgeon off of Sandy Hook that weighed 476 pounds. And that is how we've come back. Uh, there are people, I think, at Lamont that use sonar to image fish up the Hudson River. They have imaged 14-foot sturgeon in the Hudson River. So that much has changed. And, of course, we have, now I'll go to this, we have humpback whales, whales feeding on Menhaden off Rockaway Peninsula, and that's the Empire State Building in the background. We've gone in, in one, in my career, we've gone from that extreme to here. And not just there, second, I got to get, we have striped bass are back. Uh, we have osprey. I, I never saw an osprey until the last couple of decades. They filtered back and now they're everywhere. They're like pigeons. You're driving down Sunrise Highway, there's an osprey nest. A riverhead, uh, Route 104 and, and uh, Route 104, one of the traffic lights, there's an osprey nest and they just watch us go by. There's ospreys at Flax Pond. And bald eagles, there's a bald eagle um, that's been cruising around Flax Pond the last couple of years. We're hoping that he'll he'll show up and uh, show up and take up residence. So all that has changed. So of course, we're not there yet. Climate change, here's my elevator pitch. Somebody asked about climate change. Climate change is a slow motion train wreck that will probably take a generation to halt and two more generations to reverse. Now that is a daunting challenge, but we have succeeded in meeting challenges before. I have confidence in your skills and your dedication to carrying out that task. And my advice is to remember old Doc Wilson, 
and just keep putting one foot in front of the other. My final and perhaps most important piece of advice is to never lose sight of the adventure. We regularly say, see, and do things that most folks can only dream of. I have never lost the wonder of that, and I hope you never do either. And now we all know that a bad day at sea can be really, really bad. But we also know that a good day at sea is better than the best day at the office. So as I stand down, it gives me great comfort to know people like you will be carrying on the mission and I hope you find as much joy and fulfillment in your careers as I have found in mine. Thanks for everything. And please accept my best wishes for fair weather, following seas, safe harbors, and good stories to share with your colleagues. Thank you. you have questions. questions? Questions? Comments? Paul? Chef? So thank you. Uh, great talk, uh, Dom. And I'll take this opportunity to say thank you for everything you've given to SOMAS. Today, you have a lot of good advice, uh, advice well taken. It was almost all advice to individuals. And this might be one of the last times we give you this day. I'm wondering if you uh, have advice for SOMAS. I think that... You know, I have a, 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 a I've come to I've come to believe that inst that individuals have morals, have moral codes, institutions only have the moral codes that the individuals choose for them. And I think that continuing to uh, work with everybody, continuing to listen to everybody, continuing to include people is is the way to to grow. And I will say that one thing I didn't quite put in is that I look at the diversity of, uh, we weren't all white males when I got started, but it was pretty darn close. So looking at the diversity, uh, I am so gratified both here and in RV Tech where I'm the, one of the last founding member of RV Tech still there after, I don't know how many years, 30 some years. Um, it's nothing but a strength to have that diversity, to have that diverse opinions, diverse insight, diverse thoughts. And it's just, it's one of the best things that I have seen happen in my career. Thank you for that. Carl. I have a comment. A comment that Maybe this is for the younger people to that a little perspective. My comment is that in my 40 plus years of being uh, an undergraduate, graduate student, uh, professional, and uh, member of the faculty, that's the classiest talk I have ever heard. <laughs> and I've also never seen them so passionate. Well, Carl, particularly coming from you, that is just uh, that I, I, you know, thank you. Okay. Let's not let the pizza get cold. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for yeah, the thank you so much. And yes.